Thank you. You can go to the following slide. I will just make this. Following one, yeah, perfect. So, um, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Perfect. Thank you, Madonna. Thank you, Hassan, and everyone for your patience. Again, I apologize. So, what I was talking about the spina bifida remains a global disease. Here in the U.S., the numbers currently are between one to two per thousand pregnancies because of the folic acid fortification. But we know there are many other factors associated with the development of spina bifida. Some are genetic, some are environmental. But the standard of care worldwide continues to be to treat the, the, the spina bifida after birth and to monitor for the development of hydrocephalus and treatment. Next, please. You can see here from the world map that spina bifida remains a big problem, specifically in many parts of the Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, and Central America, and some parts of Eastern Europe as well. Next. Unfortunately, only 23% of the world are doing fortification of folic acid. So there's a long work, a lot of work that has to be done to reduce the spina bifida numbers worldwide. I know ILIM and many other colleagues are heavily involved with the Global Alliance to Prevent Spina Bifida. This is an amazing international work being done, trying to push many countries to uh, do a uh, food uh, fortification with folic acid. And it actually worked. In North America, the, the spina bifida numbers dropped in half in the last uh, 30 years because of the folic acid. Next. So standard of care from my own practice, as well as many places around the world continues to do the postnatal repair. The, the best way to Please reduce it. The best way to do the postnatal repairs to do it in the first 24 hours after birth. I know in many countries, uh, this can be 48 or 72 hours, but the sooner, the better. But you can see here from looking at those three pictures that those three babies will have different outcomes. Uh, the one in the bottom picture will have a likely paraplegia, 100% chance shunted hydrocephalus and probably a mortality by the age of 15 to 20. On the other hand, the left upper picture, this child probably has a 60% chance of needing a shunt for the hydrocephalus, probably will be able to walk with crutches or braces or a walker and the survival is much higher. Next, please. So the MOMS trial or management of myelomeningocele study is a study I'll talk about in a few minutes. It talks about reversing the pathophysiology. This is a surgery where they uh, developed in the 1990s. It's an operation where we operate on both the mother and the baby at the same time, while the baby's connected to the mother or the fetus connect to the mother through the umbilical cord. The goal of this uh, surgery is trying to reverse the pathophysiology. If we keep the baby or the fetus connected to the mother through the umbilical cord and we expose the spinal bifida and we close it, this can stop the leakage of cerebrospinal fluid. Next, please. And if you think about it, we the fetus is making cerebrospinal fluid in the brain. This cerebrospinal fluid is leaking through the spinal bifida defect, and this is leading to the development of high brain herniation or the Chiari type 2 malformation. This leads to blockage at the foramen magnum. This leads to blockage of the outflow of the fourth ventricle, and this leads to the development of the hydrocephalus. So the fetal repair of spinal bifida talks about repairing the defect in the lower back to allow potential reversal of the uh, spina, uh, reversal of the Chiari type two malformation or the high brain herniation and eventually improving the neurological and functional outcome as well as reduce the chance for a shunt placement. Next, please. 
So this was published in 2011. This was a prospective randomized trial. You can find it on Google if you, you can download the PDF for free. If you look it up, next please. The primary outcome they looked at in the mom study was to look at mortality and the rates of shunting for the hydrocephalus by the age of one. And the secondary outcome was looking at functional and motor outcomes by the age of 30 months. Next, please. When they compared both groups, the prenatal surgery to the postnatal surgery, they were almost equal groups, 80 patients. They found that the rates of shunting dropped in half from 80 down to 40%, significant improvement in the hindbrain herniation. Next, please. And most surprisingly, after they did the functional assessment at the age of 30 months, they found that many of the babies that had fetal surgery, actually they had improved motor outcome by having two functional outcome, two levels functional outcome better than the anatomical level which means that the L1 myelomeningocele function like L3, the L3 function like L5, and we all know how much this means when it comes to motor function. And when they looked, you can see at the bottom that uh, the percentage of the babies that were able to walk independently by the age of 30 months was almost 40% after the fetus surgery. Next. Obviously, there were maternal complications as expected, including preterm labor and premature rupture membranes. But the average gestational age for babies who had fetus surgery was around 34 weeks plus one day. But the most concerning part of the trial was the risk of um, a prematurity, where 13%, almost 10 to 15% of babies who had fetus surgery delivered prematurely under 30 weeks of gestation. Next. Next. So the take home message from the mom's trial was that fetus surgery to repair spinal bifida under 26 weeks of pregnancy improved the rates of shunting down to 40% uh, for the fetus surgery group, improved the motor function, improved cognitive function. At the same time, there was um, increased risk of prematurity. Next, please. Full-up studies looked at other aspects like orthopedic and urological benefits and found that uh, the fetal surgery can improve the severity of the neurogenic bladder and very small percentage can have bladder continence. Next. The, the biggest recommendation that changed the field of fetus surgery in North America was in 2017 when the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology came out with a national recommendation that all pregnancies that are complicated by spawn bifida who meet certain criteria should be counseled in an undirected fashion about all treatment options, including fetus surgery. So now in North America, all pregnancies, whenever there is a fetal surgery, excuse me, when there is the fetal spina bifida diagnosis for all pregnancies in North America, the obstetricians will consult with the mothers about all options, including fetus surgery. Next. I was uh, lucky at the time where we the uh, mom's trial results came out in 2011. We started the program in St. Louis. We did... Uh, 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 60 cases. And then when I moved to Florida, we did over 30, involved in over 12 international cases. We have another case coming in next week here in Florida. So the, the personal experience right now is over 100 cases. Next, please. We follow the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the mom's trial very carefully. So to include a fetus and a mother for a candidacy, at least to assess their candidacy for fetus surgery, the spina bifida has to be either myelomeningocele or myeloschisis, which means it has to be an open neural tube defect. The level has to be between T1 and S1 levels. There has to be an evidence of Chiari top two malformation or hindbrain herniation. And the gestational age has to be between 19 and 26 weeks. 
And when we do karyotyping, we uh, of the amniotic fluid, and nowadays we do microarray, it has to be normal. There's a long list of exclusion criteria, including twin pregnancies and as well as maternal anatomical uh, 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 anomalies of the uterus or a history of preterm labor. Next, please. We do fetal MRI in all cases. Here you can see in the fetal MRI, you can see the um, ventricular megaly of the brain. You can see the hindbrain herniation at the base of the skull and the fetus. And you can see the spinal bifida in the lower back. Next. We do amniocentesis to check for any karyotyping abnormalities. Next. Next, please. And we do nowadays, uh, we do for all cases. Uh, yes, please play the video if you can. It's okay. Uh, this looks basically uh, looks at, uh, click, try to click please on the uh, screen itself or push the next, yeah, here we go. Here you can see how the, we do 3D printing for all fetal surgery candidates to evaluate the size of the de defect and understand the anatomy. Here you can see the umbilical cord is wrapped around the fetus neck. Next. Next, please. You can see here the fetal uh, 3D printed models are almost identical to the intraoperative findings as well as on the fetal MRI. This is very helpful for the surgeon because we in neurosurgery, we typically operate on patients we met before. Fetal surgery is very different that you operate on a patient you've never met before. So there are a lot of surprises usually. Next. Next, please. This is a teamwork in the operating room. None of us can do this alone. We have to work as a team collaborating with obstetrics and gynecology, maternal fetal medicine, obstetric anesthesia and unitology, pediatric surgery, and many other specialties to work together as a team. Next. We do continuous ultrasound. So the ultrasonographer is monitoring the heart rate of the fetus every three minutes. Next, please. Here you can see this is a machine that replaces amniotic fluid uh, throughout the surgery. The unique part about fetus surgery that it's not expensive. All, basically it's a cesarean section and you're doing neurosurgery at the same time. So most countries where I visited and we helped establishing fetal surgery programs for spina bifida, you typically do not need to purchase equipment. All those are usually in your operating room, your anesthesiologist, using them or your obstetrician using them. It's all about building the protocol and building the team. Next, please. So after the mother uh, receives the offer for fetus surgery and she decides she wants to proceed, typically we do it around 24 to 25 weeks. The deadline is 25 weeks and six days. The mother is placed in lithotomy position after she goes under gel anesthesia. She also receives epidural anesthesia catheter prior to general anesthesia to, uh, to help with post-operative pain control. A low finasteel incision, classic cesarean incision is made. Next, please. We operate in the surgery from the beginning to the end usually. Next, please. Here you can see explanting uh, the uterus, especially in cases when there's an anterior plus placenta, which is in um, almost 50% uh, of the cases. The challenging part about fetal surgery, that in classic cesarean sections, you don't care about the placenta. You cut anywhere because you're going to discard the placenta. In fetal surgery, you have to keep the placenta safe. Next. In some cases, we use uh, retractors to help with local, uh, uh, securing the uh, uterus in one position. Next. Then we do the ultrasound to uh, lo locate the spinal bifida defect as well as locating the uh, placenta. We do this together. Next. Then we open the uterus in a safe area away from the 
fetus or uh, parts or, or the but close to the defect, but far from the placenta. Next. Then we use a stapler or clamps that are different techniques to perform the hysterotomy. Next. Here you can see with the microscope, uh, you can see the amniotic membranes, the blue part are sutured as well as stapled to the uh, uterine muscle. You can see the tubing that comes into the cavity that replaces amniotic fluid to keep the baby warm. And here in this case, we see the myelin lingocele, which is extending through the defect. Next, please. Here are some more difficult cases when we deal with flat open neural tube defects or the myeloschisis cases. You can see here there is no sac. So it is challenging for the surgeon to operate, to close the defect in some cases because of the lack of skin. And we will show you some techniques to improve that process. Next. The goal of the surgery is to repair the open neural tube defect by creating, recreating the neural tube or what we call retubularization or reneuralization of the placode. You can see here the spinal cord is flat we have to bring it back to cylindrical shape, what we call recreation of the neural tube. The second layer, which is the most important, is to bring the dura to dura to close the neural tube, uh, to close the dural defect, to stop the leak of spinal fluid or cerebrospinal fluid. And hopefully this will help with the reversal of the hindbrain herniation. Then we help, we work on bringing together the uh, subcutaneous tissues as well as the skin. Next. The father of microneurosurgery, Professor Ghazi Yasserdil, continues to impact the field until today. Around 2012, 2013, I started talking to him about, you know, we're doing fetal surgery for spine bifida. At that time, we were not using the microscope. And, and he really advised me to, uh, to convert the field from being in the mom's trial, no microscopes were used. Around 2012, 2013, after the mom's trial, he advised me to introduce the microscope in every case. And that's what we actually did. And he continues to be, uh, uh, he continues to mentor and advise about the development of uh, better microneurosurgical technique for fetuses, always showing him videos and, and advising on how to improve the field. Thank you. Next. Here you can see in the operating room, I'm standing between the mother's uh, legs, uh, the, my colleague obstetrician from the side, and the microscope coming from the top and doing the repair while the fetus is connected to the mother through the umbilical cord. Next, please. Next, please. Before the three-layer technique was developed in 2013, between 11 and 2011, 2013, we were doing two layer closure. Here, here you can see from the top left, this is myeloschisis, top middle. You can see uh, a, micro, a sharp microdissection surrounding the placode, then injecting tissue, uh, not tissue, injecting a fluid and insulin needle into the plane between the dura and the underlying lumbar fascia as a tissue expander to help elevating it before sharply elevating it circumferentially, then closing the dura. You can see the middle picture, closing the dura on top of the placode without retubularization of the placode. I will show you how this changed. Next. Before I start the repair, I do the injection myself to, to give the fetus an extra layer of anesthesia and paralysis. This includes a cocktail of fentanyl, vicaronium, atropine, and epinephrine to stimulate the heart as well. And this is typically done by the neurosurgeon. Next. It's done into the buttock of the fetus. Next. Here you can see a video showing a sharp microdissection to dissect and excise the arachnoidal membranes surrounding the placode before touching it, doing sharp microdissection circumferentially followed by injecting saline as a tissue expander to elevate the dura from the underlying lumbar fascia. The next step is to sharply elevate the dura off the underlying lumbar fascia circumferentially, because this will be the second layer of closure. 
The first layer of closure is now, which is retubularization, approximating peer to peer with proline sutures around uh, 8O proline. Sometimes we use 10O. Next, please. <clears throat> to go through, next, please. To go through step by step, you can see here for the residents on the uh, Zoom here, you can see on the top illustrations, we show you step by step how we sharply uh, dissect the arachnoid circumferentially. You can see the fluid that's being irrigated uh, to replace the amniotic fluid. Next. Next, please. Look at, go back, please. Next, please. Here you can see the tuberization, and you can look at the top left illustration and top right, going from flat placode into tubularized placode. Very careful microsurgical technique. Next. Now you can see the spinal cord has been tubularized. Next is now, next please. Now this is the most important layer, which is approximating the dura and the fascia to achieve watertight closure. This is the most important part of the surgery, which is making sure no CSF is leaking after the closure. Next, please. The next step is to do circumferential undermining, circumferentially to try to approximate skin edges together by doing circumferential undermining all the way to the flanks. Next, please. Then the first, Time, next, please. The first type of closure is here, which is the simple type. When the defect is small, it's easy to bring the skin edges together. Next, please. But when we deal with medium-sized lesions, next, please, we have to use inlay graft, like in this case. This graft is used by plastic surgeons. It's cadaveric human dermis or acellular human dermis. Now we're doing mattress closure on top of the uh, skin graft. This is for medium-sized lesions. Next, please. But for difficult wide lesions, like in this case, when you have wide myelosquesis, you have to use onlay graft, again, with the this uh, human dermis uh, cadaveric graft used by plastic surgeons. Next, please. Next, please. Here you can see we are uh, returning the uterus back after closing it in two layers. We replace the amniotic fluid, then keeping the baby warm, then we close the amniotic membranes, then we close the uterine muscle, and then we put the fetus back. Throughout the surgery, we're monitoring the heart rate every three minutes. Next. After that, the mother will get extubated. She will go to the uh, uh, women's ICU where we monitor the uh, pain control as well as monitor ultrasound daily. Next, please. On day two and day three, we start to see the fetal hips and knees uh, moving. Next, please. And by day three, in almost case, all cases. Next, please. The fetus is moving, uh, is back to the uh, baseline function of the moving the uh, ankles, toes, and, and knees. Next. We monitor the babies on a weekly basis in the outpatient clinic. Then they uh, we schedule them for elective cesarean section at 37 weeks of gestation. And in most cases, the backs are completely healed. Next. We do early functional assessment. Next, please. Next, please. This is very important in the first few days, even in the operating room after birth, to monitor the leg function and to document it. Next, please. Even the cases when we use the skin graft, uh, the way we put a skin graft inlay under the dermis, this will allow epithelialization of skin over the graft. Next, please. And even babies nowadays, when they're born with a small uh, graft exposure, we don't operate on them anymore. We just do wound care at home, and this should heal beautifully. Here you can see uh, some of the recent cases. 
where now the hysterotomies are getting smaller and smaller, still the goals of surgery would be achieved with minimally invasive openings. We This is the spinal cord plaque code. This is after closure of the dura on the top right, top bottom left, closure of the skin, and this is after the baby was born. Next. Another baby. Also, the, the now you can see our uh, exposures or doing with the microscope now, we are able to achieve uh, smaller uh, uterine openings. And just to get the job done for the fetus. Next, please. Around uh, 32 weeks, we perform fetal MRI follow-up. And here you can see on the MRI on the right side, you can see how the hindbrain herniation or the Chiari top two malformation reversed. And you can see in the bottom uh, right also uh, how the, the, in this era, how the uh, spinal CSF, the on T2 images surrounding the plaque code. Next. After the babies are born, we do MRIs around uh, six months for screening for tethering of the spinal cord. And here you can see with performing tubularization of the plaque code, we are able to achieve actually a nice healthy CSF medium between the uh, skin as well as the spinal cord or the dura on the spinal cord. And this is helpful for reducing tether cord cases in the future. Next, please. When we compared our outcomes, the mom's trial to the our uh, first 50 cases, the maternal, fetal, and neonatal outcomes were very comparable. Next, please. Next, please. The results were very comparable. And when you look in the middle here on the gestational age at birth, actually our numbers were better than the mom's trial. The, the average was 34 weeks and four days. Nowadays, it's around 35 weeks. Next, please. When we looked at the first uh, 50 to 60 cases, the average neurosurgical repair time was 43 minutes. The whole surgery takes around four hours, three to four hours, and there's zero maternal and fetal mortality. And the perinatal mortality due to um, uh, prematurity is around 3.3%, and the mom's trial is 3%. And nowadays, the ambulatory status at the age of three from our series is around uh, 60%, walking independently. Next, please. Other programs uh, looked at what's the impact of longer surgery. If you we do better closure for the fetus, does that impact the uh, maternal outcomes? And the answer is no. This series came out recently from Vanderbilt. Next, please. <clears throat> they use release incisions uh, on the flanks. We don't we don't do this to our program. We bring skin edges together over the midline. We don't do this there, but some programs use it. But still, when we do longer surgeries, regardless what the technique is, this is showing the that we are able to keep the mother safe. Next, please. When we looked at our data, looking at the risk factors associated with preterm delivery, we found that if we did fetal surgery under 23 weeks of gestation, we had higher rates of preterm labor. That's why nowadays we do all the surgeries around 25 weeks. Next. There is a learning curve that was published by our series as well as by other groups like in Europe, showing that in any new program for fetal surgery worldwide, in the first 10 to 15 cases, you'll find most of the uh, potential complications. So there is a learning curve like with any other surgery. Next. The MOMS trial only looked at shunts for treating hydrocephalus. In our series, we started looking at endoscopic thermoclostomy as the first choice to treat hydrocephalus uh, before implanting a shunt. The interesting part is after fetal surgery, not only the Chiari were reversed, but the anatomy of the floor or the third ventricle also will normalize. Like in this case, we did ETV and you can see how the hip circumference curve corrected. In some cases, there's a secondary membrane. Now, many of you who perform ETV for babies with spinal bifida 
the anatomy can be very challenging at the floor of the third ventricle. In this case, uh, that fit the surgery, the anatomy is almost normal. Normal. And now we can see uh, there is a, a secondary membrane, which was dilated as well. And now we're able to achieve uh, a patent ETV down to the uh, prepontian cistern. Sorry, the videos are slow because of the network. And now we can see through the video, through the fenestration, we have a patent ETV basal artery and skull base. Next. We published our data in 2017 for the first uh, 60 fetal surgeries. We published our data with ETV, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, and the outcomes are the average of uh, success rate between 60 and 70%. Next, please. And the gestational age at birth did not impact the success, but what really impacted it is the uh, the age at the time of the ETV. So nowadays we do it mostly over the age of four months. Next. When we looked at our CSF divergent rates, we talked earlier in the talk about how the MOMS trial looked at shunting rate 40%, our Sears in, in St. Louis on the left, 27%. Our rates right now are around 25% for shunting. And part of the, our high numbers, it should be around 20%, is that now we're, there's a prospective randomized trial in North America comparing endoscopic third ventriculostomy and choroid plexus cauterization to shunting, and we're part of this trial. So some of our babies with fetus surgery are getting randomized to a shunt because of the randomization. Next, please. This is the trial now that's running, looking at ETV with choroid plexus colorization, and we should have the results of this trial in the next three to five years. Next. The question is, does the impact of the neurosurgical technique, is there an impact on the uh, tethering rates? Next. We know around 2008, we started to hear about tether cord rates and high rates of inclusion cysts like dermoids or epidermoids. In cases that had fetal surgery, that was published by the Philadelphia group. Next, please. In their series, 60% of the cases that had tethering had, had a dermoid or epidermoid cysts, or what we call them, inclusion cysts. Next, please. Unfortunately, when you look at the literature, you cannot find any answer regarding what's the best graft. Uh, and in many cases, you do not need a graft. Next. Like in this case, a baby at 15 months, after she had fetal surgery at 25 weeks, she develops a syrinx. Next. And tethering, detethering surgery was done at the age of 12 months, all scar tissue. But the cases I'm showing you are cases from before we performed the tubularization of the placode. And I will show you in our data that Doing tubularization of the placode and doing better microneurosurgical closure is leading to improved tether cord outcomes. Next, please. Next, please. Also, cases when they have, uh, like in this case, uh, there's an inclusion cyst or epidermoid. You can see it on diffusion MRI. Next, please. And this is a challenge. And uh, here you can see that they, uh, those are difficult cases to get to remove the epidermoids. Next, please. Uh, recently, I performed surgery in an 18-year-old patient who had actually fetal surgery as part of the mom's trial. And after 18 years, you can see this large epidermoid in the sacral region had to be removed. And he uh, regained back the functional decline that he had. So we have to follow those patients for a very long time next year. When we looked at our tether cord outcomes, in St. Louis, our uh, tether cord surgery was 15%. Now in Orlando, only two cases were done in Orlando for tether cord release. So our tether cord rates now at uh, 6%, but the rate of return to the operating room after birth, here in Orlando, 3%, before it was 8%. 
So as our techniques are improving, the return to the operating room after birth uh, rates are less and the tether cord outcomes are better. Next. When we looked at our data for tethering, we found that the babies who had uh, tubularization of the placard had less tether cord out, less tether cords and less inclusion sets. So we believe that the technique uh, impacts the outcome. Next, please. Many of you may have heard about fetoscopic surgery, which is gaining momentum worldwide. Unfortunately, the techniques right now are not as good as microsurgery or open surgery. Part of it is that fetoscopically, although it may increase the chance for vaginal delivery, is not currently able to achieve the same outcomes when it comes to dissecting the placode, like you can see here in those pictures, laparoscopically, they're dissecting, cutting the arachnoid around the placode and then putting a graft, you can see in the lower left picture, then closing the skin. This, in my opinion, is the future, but not ready yet. It may need another 10 or 15 years. Next, please. Many complications have been reported recently, recently after fetoscopic surgery, but the outcomes are slowly getting better. Next, please. This is a paper actually from Istanbul that uh, looked at severe tethering in the first year of life after fetoscopic surgery. So it is good to see that many honest doctors worldwide who do fetoscopic surgery are showing that maybe this is better for the mother, maybe this will improve the chance of vaginal delivery by 50%, but we're seeing some complications for the babies after birth, but I believe the outcomes will continue to improve. Next, please. Recently, more papers coming out showing different fetoscopic techniques. You can see here the goal in the fetoscopic technique is to give protection of the spinal cord, but unfortunately, None of the fetoscopic techniques so far is able to do tubularization of the placard in a safe way. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Go ahead, play the videos, please. And, uh, assessing the motor function at uh, 12 months is very important. Assessing the ambulation, the walking, Next, please. Those are babies, all of them, who have fetus surgery, but they have high thoracic lesions walking with assistance. We monitor them closely. Next, please. But those are the ones I'm concerned about the most. Those are uh, babies. All of them have fetus surgery. They walk independently. And we have to monitor them closely because of the possibility of tether cord uh, or complications. Next, please. We are becoming more and more minimally invasive. When we started doing fetus surgery 11 years ago, after the mom's trial, the hysterotomy was almost 10 centimeters in every case. Now you can see here our hysterotomies in some cases are only four or five centimeters. And as we become more and more minimally invasive, the question is, can we, after open fetus surgery, open the door for possible vaginal delivery? And I do believe this can potentially happen as we continue to become more and more minimally invasive. But as I said earlier, I do believe the future likely is with fetoscopic surgery. Next, please. Inter international collaborations are very important working with many countries to set up their fetus surgery programs and watching them becoming successful and building volumes. Next, please. This is a recent surgery we did in uh, Dubai. I know there's a program uh, or two in Turkey and Iran and many other places. Next, please. The, on the top picture, you can see how big the fetus surgery team. Every operation we do, Typically, we have almost 14 people in the operating room. Neurosurgery, obstetrics, uh, neonatology and standby, <clears throat> ultrasonographers, anesthesiologists, pharmacists, all of us worked as a team in the operating room. But the heroes in this are the people to thank are not the team, but the mothers. 
those mothers who go through fetus surgery are the real heroes because they are uh, patients who are putting their bodies through two surgeries, two cesarean sections for a patient they never met before. Next, please. So in conclusion, next. Fetal surgery for spinal bifida is gaining excitement and momentum worldwide after the mom's trial. In our series, we believe that the impact of the, clo uh, of the closure on outcomes, functional outcomes and tether cord outcomes is real. We believe in performing multi-layered neurosurgical reconstruction. We proved that increased operative not time does not impact maternal fetal on the neonatal outcomes, we need to enroll our data in national registries. We have the NAFNET, which is the North American Fetal Therapy Network, which is a national uh, registry that um, uh, helps us putting our data. Fetoscopy showing promising results, and it will continue to improve. And we as neurosurgeons, we should continue to take the lead in deciding which techniques are the best for our babies, because we will continue to follow those patients after birth. Next, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it was incredible. Uh, I love the phrase you said that you operate on the patients you have not seen before it. It is, uh, it's mind blowing. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. So you have the impact on the life on the patients who have not been born yet and you influence the whole future. And I think it's very inspiring and thing you do. It's, it's like the job of the future, I think. <laughs> Thank you That's very much for your remarkable presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Madonna. I want to emphasize that this is teamwork. None of us can do it alone. Uh, we have to collaborate with uh, colleagues from different specialties to get the work done safely. At the end of the day, we, in neurosurgery, we will be following those patients for the rest of their lives. So we have to work closely with colleagues to make sure we are giving the, keeping the mother safe while we're giving the best, safest surgery for the, uh, for the, um, uh, baby and future child. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to now read the chat section. We have a lot of uh, letters and words of gratitude and also some questions. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, I will start from, uh, Q okay. I'll start from Chagatai Unar. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the didactic and comprehensive lecture. Would you be so kind to comment on the learning curve of battle surgery for neurosurgeons? Sincerely, your Chagatai Unar uh, from University of Turgut Ozal Medical Center in Malatya, Turkey. Thank you. So we divided our first 50 cases into five groups. And we looked at the length of the surgery, the complications uh, in five different groups. We found that most of our uh, complications were in the first 10 cases. In the second group, 10, between 10 and 20, we had less complications. And now we have over our, my personal experience, over 100 cases here in Orlando. Next week, we'll do case number 33. Every case we do, the team is more comfortable, the chemistry between team members is better, and the complications are less. So I've seen this in many countries around the world. In new programs, you have to tell the patients that this is a new program, you're going to have potential complications. This is normal, this is part of the learning curve, and with experience, the outcomes would be better. Thank you. Uh, Madonna, uh, Dr. Uh, after yeah. Uday Gupta's uh, question, I want to hear some uh, okay. professor's okay. opinion. Sure. I think Professor Pinar wanted to comment. Yeah. So uh, I will go on and uh, mm -hmm. continue. Okay. Dr. Uday Gupta uh, asked Does type of surgery endoscopic assisted laparotomy, uh, vice versa, open laparoscopic microsurgery affect the tethering? Uh, yes. There's one more question from Uday Gupta. Maybe you can read. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, oh, uh, okay. Uh, I will let you to answer this one. And uh, Dr. Uday has another question. And yeah. Thank you. So 
uh, the there is no question that all the data right now showing that we need to do a good job for the fetus for the fetal closure technique. We have to. Doing quick repairs like in the old days is not acceptable anymore. We have to give the baby the best operation similar to surgery we do on a brain tumor or aneurysm. We have to perform the best surgery we can do for the fetus to give them the best outcome possible. The problem right now is that fetoscopic techniques, although they are allowing 50% vaginal delivery, are unable to produce similar technique uh, uh, meticulous closures or achieve the same motor outcomes. And we don't have long-term data like open fetus surgery yet. On the other hand, it is the future. So with time, we're going to have robot-assisted. Ro robot we need to use the robots to achieve better fetoscopic closures and at attempt to close the placode and close the, the spinal bifida defect in multi-layers as good as open fetus surgery. I think we still need another 10 or 15 years to get there. Uh, but right now, the fetoscopic techniques as I showed you from the paper from Istanbul and other places, are showing high tether cord rates. This is not only in Istanbul, in many other places around the world, it's the same. We're seeing higher rates of tether cords after um, less meticulous closure. So I cannot tell you which one is better. I know we need more time with fetoscopy, but eventually we will get there. Mm -hmm. I think you already partial, uh, partially answered the second part. So what are the concerns of open microscopic techno, uh, techniques are uh, able to address which fetoscopic is able to? So I think <laughs> you already uh, partially answered it. So whenever we do open microsurgery, you're trying to achieve the three steps. Tubularize the placode, close the dura, achieve watertight closure to achieve reversal of the high brain herniation and achieve a good closure of the skin. Right now, fetoscopic closure is able to do a good job with the skin, but not able to achieve watertight closure for the dura. And so far, nobody have done tubularization of the placode successfully. Once we hit those three um, steps fetoscopically, then we are good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And now I'd like Dr. Pinar uh, yeah. of please. Okay. Thank Anna. you very much, Samir. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Hi. Good to see you. And a very excellent uh, presentation. And I really uh, like to see you here. And I just uh, some uh, little um, adding to your talk uh, for my friends. Okay. Okay, uh, when we talked with uh, Samar uh, in uh, 2017 at VFNS conference in Istanbul, he told us that he had been doing under microscope. So we know how to do it in a three layer uh, closure. We are tubularizing, we are detethering the cord, untethering the cord. So um, they, actually, because of COVID, we could have started at uh, 2021. And the thing is, you know, uh, when we uh, operate on a, a meningomyelocell postnatally, uh, we are dealing with the shunt infections, uh, CSF uh, leakage, uh, reoperations, uh, and et cetera. But in the fetal uh, closure of the uh, MMC, uh, more than us, the obstetricians and the perinatologists are under stress. Uh, in our first operation, only two of us, two neurosurgeons, one of them is Harun Demirji, most of the people here know him, uh, he is my assistant professor and me, but there are 15 obstetricians and perinatologists, 10 anesthesiologists, and uh, a lot of uh, blood packages inside the operation room, and they were all stressed because we are operating 20, 30 minutes in a small MMC in uh, Antenatally, but uh, they have to deal with the loss of the baby, uh, maybe uh, um, the risk of the infection, the risk of the uh, dehiscence, the risk of 
huge bleeding, even the hysterectomy. So now this is like that. We are you know, we are not the lead operators in that. We are doing the most of the thing, but the all responsibility in that operation room. Uh, like, uh, it seems like they all belong to the obstetricians. So it is uh, not for us, but the learning curve is especially for the obstetricians and perinatologists. They are under stress because maybe this is the first child of a woman and they could even, uh, she could even uh, lose his uh, uterus and the baby, of course. So th this is the problem actually. And um, so it is better not for, especially for us too, but not uh, for us, especially the obstetricians and the perinatologist has to go and see how they are doing in the operation room in a big centers. It is very important for them. And uh, when I first saw the uh, MMC antenatally in Utero, the baby, I, I just understood that what you meant, because if we don't do any this uh, all around arachnoid dissection, the cord didn't fall down inside the canal, so we cannot do any untethering. So this 360 degree dissection has, must be done uh, for the arachnoid just before the dura. So we have to tubularize, so very few uh, retethering cases and the dura uh, and also the Tubularization of the cord and then the closure of the door is very uh, simple. Actually, our, our work is, if it is not that big, uh, our work is 20, 30 minutes. It is, and we are always doing this. So the microscope is coming. We are doing the same thing. This is not a very big issue for us now, but this is a very um, I think. The connection is bad. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me, Pinar? I think it's because of the connection, I, but uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's bad. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Azizek, we can we couldn't hear you because the connection was bad. Hey, are you? Can you hear me, Pinar? Okay. Uh, uh, I want to well, say that. Before my okay, he dropped. Uh, She's back. And no. and I want to hear from uh, four more uh, pediatric neurosurgery professors. Uh, Dr. Pinar, we couldn't hear. I think Doctor Summer wants okay. to comment. Thank you. I, I have already done. <laughs> Thank you. If Thank I may comment well. on uh, on the great uh, statement from my colleague Dr. Pinar. Uh, I am in full agreement with you. There is a systematic um, process happening worldwide to involve the neurosurgeons less in this field. And uh, last month at our, uh, actually earlier this month at our national meeting of the AANS American Pediatric Neurosurgeon meeting, I gave a talk on fetal surgery. My take home message from the talk was that we as pediatric neurosurgeons, we have to take the lead. We have to take ownership of the field, otherwise we're going to lose it. In some countries around the world, I watched fetal surgery being done while the neurosurgeon is standing at the corner of the room and watching, or they're doing irrigation, or they're holding the laparoscope. But after the babies are born, those are our patients. We're going to deal with the tether cord. We're dealing with the Chiari. We're dealing with the hydrocephalus. So I congratulate you, Pinar, and you and your team for starting a program. Uh, there's no question with time, the chemistry will improve between all members of the team, but it is very essential to have a clear conversations about each other's role. And about the, about the, and also I highly recommend visiting other centers as a team. From day one, I invited you to Orlando and you and your team are again invited yeah. anytime you want. On a monthly basis, we have an international team with us in our fetal surgeries. So you and your team are welcome as well as Turkish colleagues. Any of you are welcome if you want to come in the future. It is important 
to go and visit other centers, see how they do it. At the end of the day, this is proven that longer fetal surgery is not dangerous for the mother. This is proven by our data, proven by Vanderbilt twice. This is a, this is a well-known knowledge now. So the neurosurgeon should be able to perform a good closure that you respect and they like for their baby while everybody else is doing a good job keeping the mother safe. So I highly recommend uh, to continue conversations with your colleagues and to continue working on the, on the effort to keep both the mothers safe while the baby's closure improving. And I'm happy to connect with you offline as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also, I want to hear from four more neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery professors. Uh, from, Please. Uh, Professor Karabalı, Professor Duru, Professor Anal, and please uh, Karabalı, and Professor Öcal also. Samer, hello. Thank you Thank very you. much for your good presentation. Thank you, Hakan, uh, Thank you, my friend. You, you can do uh, wonderful works. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Technique is not difficult. I take a lot of notes in my papers. Technique is not difficult, but teamwork is important. Uh, I wish in my country we can do that uh, like yours, like you. Uh, you are doing masterpiece for the uh, myelomeningo cell. Masterpiece works, uh, I think. Uh, I have a, a few questions. Uh, do you need any uh, during the dural repair? Do you need any allograft or synthetic graft uh, uh, for repairing the dura mater? Do you use? Second question is about adhesions. Adhesions. Do you use any adhesions barrier for uh, repairing? Last question is about the bladder function. How about the bladder function after the birth? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Hakan. Thank you, my friend. Hoping to see you soon. So uh, to start with, uh, the, the better the microneurosurgical closure uh, mm -hmm. for the myelomeningocele or myeloschisis, the less the adhesions. So what we're try trying to do is, when you, why do we have adhesions? Why do we have tether cord in myelomeningocele surgery? It's because the pia of the flat placode Mm -hmm. is exposed to the dura or the muscle or whatever you're doing. So what we do when you retubularize, you approximate in P at P and now you recreate the neural tube. And now you're allowing CSF to come and surround this uh, new tube. And then you achieve watertight closure with biological tissues, which are patients own dura. That's why we inject the tissue expander to elevate the dura of the underlying lumbar fascia. Sometimes we do uh, 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 myofascial flaps. It doesn't matter what you do. What matters is that you bring dura and myofascia to the midline to achieve watertight closure. I can tell you the last time I used dural substitute hmm. to, to help me with achieving watertight closure has been at least five years. Nowadays, if we do a good microsurgery circumferentially, elevating the myofascial flaps as well as the uh, dura, you will be achieving it without uh, dural grafts. On the other hand, we use the skin graft, like I showed earlier in wide difficult cases as inlay or onlay. Yeah. To answer your question about the, um, the, the urological function, as I showed earlier, the mom's trial, was expensive. It was $7 million. And uh, they did not have, um, part of the statistical analysis and studies did not include tracking urological or orthopedic functions. So all the studies that are published right now are retrospective. So urological function was never studied in a prospective randomized fashion. So all what I can tell you that the large paper from CHOP in Philadelphia, the large series from our program showing improved neurogenic bladder 
they always have neurogenic bladder, but it is less severe. But I can tell you every year, at least I have one or two children at the age of four or five, they come to my office and, and I, the parents tell me that they are almost potty trained. They can, they know when to go to the bathroom. They can have the feeling. It's not perfect, but a urinary continence or control of bladder and bowel, I'm seeing it more and more nowadays, but they still, all of them have a neurogenic bladder, but less severe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akhant Shikular. I think Dr. Soner Duru uh, raised your hand, wanted to come uh, Yes, sir. Uh, thank, pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for our wonderful presentation. I am originally from Turkey, but I work, uh, I study in Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Cincinnati Children's Center. I am a special pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, so we uh, design uh, fiddle, uh, hydro, uh, fiddle neurosurgical research design about MMC and hydrocephalus. Uh, so it's a very challenging situation, of course. Uh, um, in clinical, uh, the Cincinnati Fetal Center, uh, the uh, recommend for to patient uh, fetoscopic or open. Of, of course, very challenging situation, uh, especially the most important uh, station is the operation time. Operation time is very important. Uh, what, uh, my first question is, what about the research uh, subjects? For example, we, we work, uh, we studies about uh, smart page is fetoscopic, um, some, um, what, what, can I, what can I do, what can we do, uh, approach uh, techniques or, or another uh, research or uh, research subjects about hydrocephalus? So we work large animal studies, sheep. Uh, so fiddly TV like this, maybe maybe you you can see some uh, our uh, papers. Uh, so very interesting situation. So what about your uh, the research subjects, Dr. Samar? Thanks so much. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Are you okay? Thank you, Dr. Sonar. Uh, excellent work always comes from Cincinnati. It's one of the leading centers. They started doing it uh, open and then they introduced phytoscopies. Yeah. The work from Cincinnati is always respected. So I, I would like to summarize the research efforts in three areas. Each one of us who performs fetus surgery has to make the technique better. It's a group effort. Wherever you yeah. are, in Zurich, Istanbul, Cincinnati, Orlando, wherever you are, whatever you do, open microscope, non-microscope, fetoscope, not fetoscope, whatever you do, each one of us is responsible to make the technique better, always. And the technique I'm doing right now is better than three years ago, better than eight, better than 11 years ago. So all of us have to improve it. And then when we improve it, we have to teach each other. We have to publish. We have to discuss it all the time. So we are all, there's no perfect fellowship for this. There's no textbook about this. Uh, you rarely have videos about this. We all help each other. So there is no excellent basic platform to certify or train people in fetus surgery. We learn from each other. And with time, we all improve what we do and we teach it to others. So the the... Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is improving the technique. We're all responsible to make things better. And I know Cincinnati have done a lot of good work with the uh, with the uh, fetoscopic techniques. The second I want to say is we need to compare outcomes to each other. That's the best research we can do. The Nowadays, we have the NAFNET, which is the North American Fetal Therapy Network. Yes. It's the perfect platform right now for all fetal surgery centers to enroll their data and compare each other. I can go now to NAFNET data or REDCap data on my computer. I can see how my outcomes are doing compared to any other fetal surgery center in North America. And every two years nowadays, they're summarizing the data and publishing them. So we're going to see in the next five to 10 years, more and more publications coming out from NAFNET, which is a collective research effort from all centers 
yes, which sorry. is the most important actually to compare each other so we can do better. The last thing I want to say is the, uh, and new things are coming out. Fetoscopy came up. Nowadays, people are talking, I see one of the questions from one of the uh, chat room about stem cells. There are some people in California now talk about stem cells. I disagree with it because they're calling it the cure trial, which is completely misleading to the patients when you're calling a study a cure trial. We don't cure spina bifida in fetal interventions. We make it better. We look for better outcomes, but we never cure it. So uh, in our center, the research is focused on reducing maternal complications, making the surgery uh, better for the baby, but safer for the mother, and also making micro adjustments. I can tell you here in the US, we replace amniotic fluid on every case. We monitor the, the temperature in the amniotic fluid in every case. I did the same surgery in Germany, in Heidelberg. I did the same surgery in Dubai. I did it in many other countries, completely different than our technique here and the outcomes are good, which means there's no perfect way to do it. All of us, wherever we work, we have to adjust our protocol to keep the surgery safe for the mother and the baby, but we don't have to do it the same way. Microscope, no microscope. Amniotic fluid replacement, yes or no, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we achieve all the goals systematically. So those are the current research efforts happening in different places. But um, thank you again for all the work you're doing in Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah we can talk about it after that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Anal. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Professor Ababa. That's an outstanding lecture, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I would also like to learn what are the major ethical issues during your in utero surgery procedures? How religion, belief, traditions affect your in utero practice, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Onel. So this is an excellent question, and I will cover it in two areas. In 2011, when the MOMS trial results came out, we were the first center in the Midwest, actually one of the first centers in the world to start performing this surgery immediately six weeks after the trial results came out. I can tell you, we were attacked uh, professionally, ethically, morally, religiously at all levels, that we are people who are dangerous, we are interrupting nature, we are not good human beings. On the other hand, if you think about it, Professor Onal, there are very few things in neurosurgery were proven in a prospective randomized fashion. So this is actually science. We are in fetal surgery performing work that was proven systematically in a prospective randomized manner. Even you and I, when we operate on a subdural hematoma or, or uh, take out a brain tumor, we rarely have prospective randomized studies to prove that what we're doing is right or wrong. Fetal surgery is a done deal. This is science, this has been proven, and all what we need to do is to make it better. Nowadays, things are different. Nowadays, I'm dealing with the opposite. Nowadays, the parents come to our clinic crying, wanting, wanting fetal surgery, because you know, social media, TV, YouTube, People come pushing for fetal surgery, and my job is the opposite, to tell them, slow down, we need to see the criteria, we need to see if you're a candidate or not. This is not a cure, this is not, um, it does not always work for every baby. So we go systematically in a scientific way to tell them about the surgery and we counsel them in an indirect fashion. So this is the first part of the answer. The second part is, it is extremely important for every hospital that performs fetal surgery to form an ethics committee. We have at our hospital, we created an ethics committee around 10 people. Some of them, many of them are not doctors. Some of them come from uh, administrators, some from religious background, some leaders, senior colleagues from the specialty who do not perform fetal surgery. And this ethics board or ethics committee is very essential in guiding the operations of the program. 
So when I receive a mother referral and a fetus and the fetus, we do the karyotyping or the microarray for the amniotic fluid and we find a rare genetic deletion or micro deletion. According to the criteria, we should not offer fetus surgery. Well, we consult the genetics team. We say, well, this is clinically insignificant, but it still meets the ex exclusion criteria. And that's when the fetus surgery team has to put the case in front of the ethics board for guidance. So to answer your question, uh, nowadays, worldwide, it is um, not considered magic. This is not experimental. This is a proven scientifically, and we we need to help each other getting it done safely. But it is important at your local co uh, programs to have ethics uh, teams, ethical ethics teams who can help you in selected cases. But I can tell you, in Europe, in Australia, in China, in Japan, where countries where there's a high termination rates of uh, pregnancies of spina bifida, we're seeing now things happening worldwide where the rates of termination in some countries where fetal surgery programs are building up, the termination rates are getting less. That's number one. Number two, in some countries like in India, India is an amazing country, but they have a big problem, spina bifida. Uh, I was just recently in India in two different cities talking about fetus surgery. We did so many lectures and programs, but uh, we need to work around the local culture. We need to work the, 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 with the community, with the government. We need to work with everybody that every pregnancy, we need to try to save it as much as possible. Fetal Spawn bifida is not a cure, but can help improving outcomes. And the L5 or S1 myelomeningocele is very different from L1 or T12 or T11. So we as neurosurgeons, we need to get involved in those conversations with the parents before termination of pregnancy decisions are made. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Ajal from Arkansas and uh, Uday Gupta from India, please. Thank you so much, Samir, my friend. I have listened to this talk multiple times and every time I listen to it, I learn something new because there's something new. Thank and you, I believe, yeah, I mean, um, this is great because I believe personally that this is gonna be the future. And even though it's not the standard of care, even in United States and other high income countries, it will be the standard of care. Like my center, we don't do it. Uh, but still, it is um, actually, a, I think we take it as a granted because we have enough resources that we can build programs. You are the, the person who goes around the world and try to build up programs. But as you know, better than anyone else, still find a bifida is a problem of socioeconomic status. So we see a lot more spina bifida patients in lower middle income countries. And fetal surgery is a teamwork, which is still very expensive, including in the United States, as no, not every center has it. Unless it becomes the standard of care and we have equitable you know, healthcare systems in every country in the world, it'll be a problem no matter what. Even though I believe personally that this is gonna be the future and the standard of care for spina bifida patients, we still have to take into account that in lower middle income countries, the main thing is still prevention, prevention, prevention. So, and we know that's still cheaper uh, than doing any surgery or taking care of our patients with spina bifida at every level, or um, you know, doing fetal surgery as a team because it's expensive. The one thing that comes to my mind is, of course, like, you know, in countries where the resources are a little bit more than some other lower middle income countries, maybe doing fetal centers. You know, what is your opinion about having fetal centers like Europe does, right? Like in one or two centers in Europe because their population is small, the countries are small, the, you know, distances between countries or cities are less, of course, when compared to 
some other places or in the United States. Even here, we send you our patients sometimes to get care for fetal surgery. So what do you think about forming centers? You know, maybe it's a good model for some countries where the resources are scarce and experience is just building up. Thank you, my friend, Island. A couple of things I want to say, a great uh, statement uh, on point. First thing is about prevention. Prevention is the key. But as our friend Jeff Blount said, we think fetus surgery and prevention, fetus surgery and folic acid can work as a combo. Correct. So we work hard, all of us worldwide, and you're doing a lot of this wonderful work internationally. Worldwide, we have to focus on prevention, folic acid, uh, education. We need to work on prevention. We need to lower spine bifida rates, but still we're going to have some cases happening and when they happen, if if we can, uh, over time, look at, uh, for selected candidates, fetus surgery as an option. If you look at this disease 20 years from now, it's a completely different disease because you lowered the rates significantly. And the ones you could not prevent, you still give them the benefits of fetus surgery. So this can be a great combo effect. Yeah. These. Second answer, this, the answer to your second uh, state is that I agree. Central, centralization will lead to better outcomes. Uh, on the other hand, in some countries, the concept of public health care versus private health care can be a challenge. Uh, here in the United States, Florida is the, uh, is the fourth largest population in the United States. We only have one center in Orlando. And we get our patients from Miami, from elsewhere, because now we, we have a program, we have volume. It is a matter of time before we have another program in the state. But in some states like the state of New York, there's zero programs. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy to set up a program. In Boston, there's no program. So with time, you're going to see one. Centralization in different regions around the world is the first step. Until it becomes standard of care, then you'll see more and more programs. Turkey is a beautiful big country. Istanbul, Ankara, the eastern part of Turkey. Eventually, Turkey is going to have three or four, maybe more programs. And some of them are going to be with low volume, with good outcomes, where they will take care of the bread and butter, standard myelin lingocele. And some others are going to be with high volumes, they're going to take care of the complex cases, like the difficult myelous cases. So centralization is helpful. In Europe, we're seeing a program in Spain, a, a couple in Germany, one in Switzerland, one in Belgium, mm -hmm. uh, but oh, there was one in Poland now. So there are some areas around the world where programs are popping, and but over time, that we're going to see more and more coming out. What matters is not doing the surgery. What matters is tracking outcomes, having good outcomes and having good volume. You cannot maintain a good program with good outcomes if you're doing, in my opinion, less than five cases per year. You need to have, in our uh, data, we, we looked at it, you need to do 10 cases per year to have good outcomes, minimum. Correct, correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Gupta, please, you can turn. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask the host, uh, first my question, how would you segregate your patients for pitoscopy versus open mini laparotomy? And uh, like you said, there's not much resources available to go in more depth and to gather more knowledge about this procedure. Now, uh, what would you recommend uh, to take the next step forward and how to learn more of this? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, in regards to training, there is no formal training. The most important thing for you as a neurosurgeon is to partner with a team who believes in this. You need to find obstetricians or gynecologists, especially with expertise in maternal fetal medicine, who believe in this. You need to have an anesthesiologist who's willing to join. Once you have the team, I advise to to, you know, after listening to lectures, having internal discussions, to go visit a center, that's highly recommended. 
come visit the, go come here or go anywhere else visit a center where you watch the surgery as a team you and two colleagues and once you see the surgery you go back to your country to your program and you start building the protocols and you invite somebody to come and help you with your first case this is a very important to have someone with you in your first case. There's no formal training. Uh, uh, the, the, the concept of performing fetal surgery in a new program depends on you going somewhere to watch it. You build a team at your town, you build a protocol, and people come and help you with your first case, and then you're on your own and you will do well. And then you need to track your outcomes and improve your your protocols. That's the first, um, uh, the, the second question. The first question about how do we divide open to, to or, feet, or fetoscopy. At our center right now in Orlando, we are looking closely at potentially starting fetoscopy, but so far, because we have so, so good outcomes with the open fetus surgery, and we established an excellent track record of safety and outcomes, with open fetus surgery, we're not ready to go to fetoscopy uh, before the fetoscopy can show us techniques anywhere close to what we're doing with open fetus surgery. I think it will likely happen in the next three to five years. But uh, on the other hand, in many other places like in Cincinnati and Houston, there are places where now they're doing more and more fetoscopy. They decide the places where they do both they decide based on many factors, some of them based on internal studies and second, based on anatomical uh, uh, variations, including the placenta. If you have an anterior placenta, what's the, how complex the lesion is. So there is some cherry picking when it comes to picking the technique at places where they do both. But what matters is whatever you do, just do it safely for both the mother and the baby. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll continue. If no one else has a comment or question, I'll continue with the chat. There are a couple of questions here. So mm -hmm. Salim Ayhan uh, says, uh, thank you for the great lecture, Dr. Al-Baba. What is your idea about the study held at the UC Davis at Sacramento Cure Therapy? Do you think this will work or not? What is the future? What do you think for the future research? Thank you. Respectfully, yours. Thank you so much. So, as I mentioned earlier in my talk about, or in, my, in the discussion, uh, I did. I believe the group in UC Davis, they did three cases. I looked very, very carefully through this publication or this paper or this media about this topic. I saw zero mention of neurosurgeons. I saw uh, a, a, um, a name or labeling of the study as the cure therapy, which is completely misleading. I respect the effort of trying stem cells, but stem cells can help with function, but stem cells will not reconstitute the anatomical defect. Stem cells may give a better chance for the neuralation of the cells and maybe the myelination of the cells, but will not reconvert a flat spinal cord into cylindrical, stem cells will not fix the dural defect. So whatever we do with stem cells, it has to be a group effort similar to what I showed earlier. We need, whomever is doing the stem cells, I know in this study, it's pediatric surgeons. You need strong partnership with neurosurgery. You need to know where to put the stem cells. You need to discuss what you're going to do with the plaque code. What are you going to do about the dura? It's not about stem cells. It's about the reversal of the Chiari. It's about uh, having a good closure for the skin and we need long-term data. So to answer the question, I respect the effort. I'm not sure if it's going to work or not, but I respect the trial. But most importantly, you need to involve people who they do this for, this is their business, who are the neurosurgeons. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, response. Uh, Dr. Pinari says, do you use TISL over dural closure? In, in almost all cases, I do, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Okay, next question is uh, from the medical student Kiran Chata here in Georgia. I'm, a, uh, I'm not a surgeon uh, like many of, of you, I'm just a student of the first year. Is there any possible way or potential that instead of performing surgery, we stimulate the cell division of neural tube under control conditions like uh, medication or laser uh, to the affected area, which is spina bifida, so that the enhanced cell division of the neural tube poses the opening? Thank you. Great I question. I think young minds have a, yeah, quite inquiring. Well, clearly young minds are smarter than, than me. Uh, when I have the more gray hair, the less minds I have. So <laughs> I, I think uh, the way the student Koram is, is looking at this is at a deep embryological level. And which is not unusual actually for young people to start thinking that direction. Because nowadays we're looking at gene therapy, okay? We're talking all day long about folic acid, about fetus surgery. But if you think about it, what is spina bifida? At the end of the day, spina bifida has been linked to genetic background as well. As many diseases and cancer and many other areas, we're focused now on gene therapy and how to go at the cellular level and prevent disease from before it actually happens. So I don't have an experience with this um, uh, question, but obviously doing animal studies would be key before doing any of this. Animal studies have been proven to be very essential in the field of fetal surgery. So this could be part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Another student of mine, Tammy Okaji, is asking, going by the inclusion criteria used in mom's trial, would the same surgical approaches apply in cases where the spina bifida is present above T1 or below S1? If not, what would be the preferred intervention? Thank you. So thank you. So before the mom's trial, there were a series of uh, individualized cases done at Vanderbilt and at CHOP, which looked at fetus surgery for spina bifida in general before there was a trial. That's why the trial came in. That trial showed that it makes no sense to offer it below S1. Why? Because those kids are going to do fine anyway. When you have spina bifida at S2, S3, 60% of them do not have Chiari malformation. So why to expose the mother and the fetus for a risk of fetus surgery for an outcome that potentially is going to be good anyway. So that's why we don't offer it below S1. Above T1 is we are going into the cervical region and cervical spina bifida is extreme, has poor neurological prognosis. So I do not believe it should be offered there because of the risk of mortality. You're very close to the brainstem. On the other hand, one of the topics I did not discuss today is that there was a recent paper from Sao Paulo, Brazil, that looked at fetus surgery for encephalocele. They did around 20 cases, selected cases, encephalocele where only one third of the brain herniated into the encephalocele defect. And they did repairs. They found improvement in the microcephaly, less shunting. We're actually looking at potentially starting a program here for it. So Fetal surgery does, in neurosurgery does not stop at um, uh, myeloma meningocele. I know there's a group in Tumin, uh, Siberia, and Russia where they did ETV in a fetus. I know there's a group in the US a long time ago did fetal interventions for severe hydrocephalus by shunting to the amniotic cavity. I know there's a group in Brazil now doing fetal surgery for encephalocele. When can we go? full board into another area in fetal interventions, we need science. We can talk all day long what we can do in fetal surgery, but we have to keep the mother safe and we need to do a good job for the baby. So we can't do anything unless we have prospective randomized data showing good outcomes. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kurama and Tammy for your Madonna, questions. Uh, Doctor, last, Madonna. I think I'm gonna read less. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes. uh, there are two uh, other things. One of them from uh, Professor Açık Göz and the others uh, from Nurullah Gözmen'e. One of you. my uh, residents, you missed thank you. his thank. And they can thank by themselves. My oh, pleasure. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Samer. 
I'm very impressed with your great work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. And Take thank care. you also for underlying the importance of neurosurgery and microsurgery. Thank, thank you, you very much. It's thank an you honor. Very much. Much. Valuable. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Also, come to Antalya. <laughs> inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Turkey is my second home, so for sure I'll be coming, inshallah. Thank you. You are welcome. Always. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And all I thank all of my uh, friends, neurosurgery friends. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. For joining. Uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Nurullah uh, from Izmir. Uh, I think he's not uh, here. I okay. can read his thanks. Uh, sorry. Nurullah Kösmene says that it was an amazing presentation. Thank you, Professor Elbaba. Nurullah Kösmene, Izmir. And there is one more, two more. Yeah, two more. Okay. Gratitude. Afan Jumba, a medical student from Georgia, of uh, Pakistan, but in Georgia. Thank you so much for such an informative presentation. As a medical student, can I ask you for the tips that could help us in the future? Sure. Well, the tips are here that you're here in this talk. So the fact that medical students are interested in attending talks at a, at a highly complex level in the field of neurosurgery, that by itself, you're doing your homework. Uh, uh, when I was a medical student, I never had this opportunity. So we're, you're, you're in the right place at the right time. So keep going. Thank you very much. And another thanks for uh, Safar Beck, uh, Said Beck. Thank you very much. And I would <laughs> love to again express my deepest gratitude. It was a remarkable lecture, wonderful cases, uh, very inspiring. And thank you so much, all the uh, speakers and all the participants for your contribution uh, for today's lecture. Thank you very much. I, I, we get to the letters of gratitude here. Uh, Gizem Kul uh, from Marmara University says, thank you for the informative and inspiring presentation. Uh, we would like to see you in Marmara University. So you got a lot of invitations here and I would add that Georgia would uh, be honored to host you as well. <laughs> a pleasure and uh, thanks to Safar Bek as well. It was a pleasure to be in Kazakhstan last month. And uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be um, with this amazing group. I know it's uh, I know it's late right now in Turkey and other and in India and other parts of the world. So uh, we will keep in touch. And if there's anything we can do to help you uh, locally with your programs, uh, it's a privilege to help to partner with you. So keep up the great work and thank you again for the invitation. I truly enjoyed being here with all of you. Thank you so much, Professor Alvaro. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.